Hi everyone. The next challenge we're going to look at is generation. In the ge generation, the goal is to learn a generative process that produces wrong modalities. And the goal of producing these wrong modalities is that we want to also reflect cross-modal interactions, structure, and coherence. There's three types of generation we're going to look at. The first type is summarization, where the goal is to go from more modalities and more data into a smaller compressed set of modalities and data specifically to reduce the information content in our data from big to small. There's also translation, where the goal is to maintain information content. For example, taking an image and trying to describe as fully as possible the contents of that image in natural language. And finally, creation. We're trying to go from something small, perhaps one image or perhaps latent variables, into a large set of modalities that are coherent and structured together. And the goal here is to expand the information content in, uh, in our modalities. In addition to the dimension of content, either reducing, maintaining, or expanding content, the other axis that we're going to look at is how we're actually going to generate our data, because it's very difficult to decode high-dimensional multimodal data. And the two main categories here are that of generating through exemplars, where we have a dictionary of transformations and we're trying to retrieve um, something similar from this dictionary or through generation. We're using this dictionary of translations to learn a fully generative model, which we're then going to apply for a new data point. So let's go look at a first sub-challenge. We're going to start with translation because that's what people probably resonate with the most. And I'm sure some of you have seen this example of um, this DALI model of taking very weird compositional, a very weird sentences that composed very weird concepts together, such as an armchair in the shape of an avocado, and still being able to generate very realistic images. So in this falls under the sub-challenge of translation, trying to translate from one modality to the other while keeping information content and being consistent with the cross-modal interactions that are underlying this translation. So how does this uh, DALI method work? We're going into a bit more details. The DALI method works by first taking a bunch of images and training a discrete VAE just on this image representation space. So that involves encoding your representations into a set of discrete latent variables and being able to decode these images back into the original image. And this can be done at scale across many, many images. It doesn't require you to pair up your images with, with text. And that's kind of the first pre-training stage, training this discrete VAE image encoder and decoders. The second step is to learn this autoregressive transformer that maps language into your discrete uh, image representation space. And this is a part that requires you to use paired data between images and text. But again, you can obtain this as scale from a lot of images and captions on the internet. So given this uh, caption, an armchair in the shape of an avocado, uh, map it through a text encoder into a sequence of text representations, and learn a translation model into your image representation space. And once you've done that, you can then do the third step, which is to generate from this image representation space into actual images. So if you look at the actual dimensions of your sub-challenges, one is content. How is the content actually um, changing? Well, in this case, we are trying to maintain content because it's a translation problem. We're trying to capture as much as language and map them directly into images. In order to maintain content, the key underlying principle here is to do representation coordination. If you recall back from the very first sub-challenge, of representation coordination. And the way we are coordinating these representations is via supervised translation by taking paired data and mapping from one modality to the other. This essentially captures cross-modal interactions that correspond with each other, right? having the same meaning. And on the generation side, it is a mix of both exemplar and generative. Exemplar, because you're starting with a discrete VAE, which basically stores a discrete visual codebook at the representation level, and generative because you're taking some discrete points and generating into an image. So those are the key ideas behind this DALI model. Uh, subsequently, you probably might have seen DALI 2, which uh, further improved performance uh, using two key ideas. One is to use a clip encoder and one is to use diffusion models. So where do these ideas come in? Well, the clip encoder comes in when you're trying to encode your image. Instead of training a VAE directly uh, retraining a discrete VAE on top of the images, we're just going to use the clip encoder to map these images into your clip image embedding space. 
And again, you're going to use a second step, which is use a diffusion model that takes in your text through a text encoder into your text representations and using a diffusion model to generate these clip image embeddings. And finally, the diffusion model is also used to generate your data. But although these were improvements, the key underlying principles are the same. In terms of content, you're again doing representation coordination via clip similarity this time. Instead of using supervised translation, you're using the clip similarity space in order to coordinate your data. And if you recall from um, the first part of the talk, the first sub-challenge of representation, clip is exactly a model that takes in images and text as input and learns a common representation space where similarity is respected. And again, this allows you to capture corresponding cross-modal interactions. And perhaps one big improvement in DALI 2 is the fact that CLIP, which is trained a lot more data between image and caption pairs, is able to learn these corresponding cross-modal interactions really, really well. And on the generation side, you're going to use fully generative models um, that take in these CLIP uh, embedding spaces in the middle and generates your actual raw images. So those are some examples of translation. We're also going to look at summarization. Uh, in this case, summarization, the goal is to take multimodal data that is very high dimensional with large information content and to try to reduce information content while highlighting the most important parts of the input. And one of the biggest challenges in summarization is actually getting good data sets that have both the input, which is high dimensional multimodal data, as well as the output, which is summarized most important parts of the multimodal data both annotated. So one example of such a good data set is this how-to video data set which contains very long transcripts describing uh, um, images of people cooking in the, either demonstrating something in the video, cooking being one of them. And the goal here is to do summarization. We are trying to summarize both the transcript and also summarize the video. The core idea, the key idea here is that it's a challenging data set we need to capture complementary cross-modal interactions with this some amount of information in text, uh, in, in video, that is not present in text. For example, the fact that this is a Cuban breakfast and this is a free cooking video. And together, those need to come in um, capturing complementary cross-modal interactions while also reducing information content to summarize your multimodal data. And while I won't get into details of how the model exactly works, uh, in terms of content, the main key idea is that you want to do fusion using joint representations. So fusing your data into one joint representation, which can borrow from the ideas of representation fusion that we've seen again in the first sub-challenge. Uh, this allows us to capture complementary cross-modal interactions, where one information present in one modality is pr not present in the other modality. So that's complementary cross-modal interactions. And at the generation step, we're going to do abstractive summarization, which actually takes in this joint representation and decodes it word by word. Uh, so this paper did it by abstractive summarization. There are also analogs that do extract, extractive summarization, which extracts words from uh, the long part instead of generating the summary word by word. So that's summarization. And very briefly, just talking about the third sub-challenge of creation, the goal is to simultaneously generate multiple modalities, where the key idea is to increase information content. But you can't just increase information content unrestricted. There's so many possible ways of increasing information content. So there's several restrictions that have to be put in place. And the main restriction is to maintain coherence within and across modalities. This makes sure your generated data is realistic. So perhaps what you could start with is um, either one latent variable or several latent variables or one image. There's many possible um, input th inputs that you can start with. And the goal is to perhaps generate images, for example, of the dog on the beach, of the waves crashing into the beach, of people playing volleyball on the beach. Uh, so that'll be the image modality or the video modality. Um, also language modality that perhaps describes or corresponds to these, to, these, um, to these generated images. And also audio that corresponds to these um, images and text at the same time. So one big correspondence that you want to capture is the fact that there should be cross-modal interactions that are realistic across these modalities. So for that, recall representation and alignment. How can you make sure these cross-modal interactions actually exist? And with the, uh, within the same modality, you also want to make sure that there is some temporal and causal and logical structure. 
um, so that respects the way that these modalities are generated naturally. So for that, um, you know, certain ideas in the reasoning sub-challenge could be useful here. But again, this is a very ideal scenario. This is a very, very big open challenges. Uh, and there's many, there's very few approaches that can actually achieve this. There's almost no approach that can achieve this right now. So I'm just going to cover very quickly uh, one, uh, one example of creation, which is a very initial attempt. And this attempt basically works upon factorized latent variables to generate your data. So in this case of factorized latent variables, so you have ZA1 capturing just one variable, a uh, unimodal variable, ZA2 capturing another unimodal latent variable, and ZY capturing the cross-modal interactions between these two variables. You can then take in combinations of these variables and put it through a decoder to try to generate your data. So in this case, uh, ZA1 will capture <clears throat> the style of generating in this SVHN type of images. ZY, the cross-modal interaction, will capture the actual digit. So together, they allow you to generate the digit 9 in this SVHN style. ZA2 will then capture the MNIST type of um, style. And together with the decoder, uh, together with ZY, which captures the digit 9, this allows you to generate the digit 9 in the MNIST style. And you also need to make sure that yeah, ZY latent variable is able to predict that these are actually labels of a digit 9. So again, ZA1 and ZA2 capture unimodal structure uh, from SA, uh, SVHN data set and MNIST data set, respectively. And ZY captures a cross-modal interaction, the fact that they all refer to the number 9. Such a factorized model then allows you to do more free conditional generation. So you fix the digit in ZY as 5, then you can generate 5s of varying styles in SVHN by changing ZA1, and 5s of varying styles in MNIST by changing ZA2. And likewise, you can just fix ZA1, that fixes the style of MNIST, and you can change ZY to get many different digits, 0 through 9, of the same style. And likewise, you can fix ZA2. So that fixes the style of MNIST, and you can then change ZA, uh, ZY, uh, which changes the number 0 through 9 in different styles. So the key idea here is that in order to generate more content, using factorized representations is a way of ensuring that you're more controllable upon the content that you wish to generate. And this factorized method allows you to expand the number of, uh, the, the number of complementary cross-modal interactions in your generation. And finally, the actual generation is done via a generative model. But there's many, many open challenges here. Um, one big open challenge is that beyond text, images, and video, there's many other modalities such as audio, time series, tabular data, where it's a big open question where generation, uh, on how to do generation. Uh, one other big challenge is that of translation between descriptive text and images. So with descriptive text and images, like the ones that you've seen at DALI, uh, these basically capture very clear corresponding cross-modal interactions. But what are the other types of cross-modal interactions for which we can capture, for which translation is possible? Uh, for creation, it's also a big challenge. Can we actually achieve fully multimodal generation with coherence across modalities through cross-modal interactions? and also consistency within modalities by capturing uh, causal and logical structure. Another big challenge is that of model evaluation. Uh, right now, a lot of it is cherry-picked, a lot of it is based on human evaluation. What are the ways of coming up with better automatic or human-in-the-loop evaluation methods? And finally, a core challenge is that of um, ethical concerns. Uh, many of these methods are going to be trained to propagate certain stereotypes, such as generating uh, things that are that, um, that, that propagate stereotypes about certain race, certain genders. And people have also shown that GPT-like models, language models, are able to extract sensitive data, such as people's uh, phone numbers and addresses. So how can we better quantify the ethical concerns of these generative models, while also ensuring that they Im improve um, the privacy and security of these models? So these are all open challenges in generation. Thank you.